Okay, done. Pleasant good afternoon, viewers. Welcome to the Ministry's live Facebook event. My name is Alana Ramrup Samaya, and I am an agricultural officer with the Agricultural Services Division. Um, I have here with me today Mr. Ravi Narayan, who is an agricultural assistant to who's an agricultural assistant to um, also in the agricultural services division. We are actually both based at the La Reunion plant propagation station. So today we're going to talk to you about breadfruit. Um, we're going to give you a little insight as to what we do on the station and how we propagate breadfruit plants on a commercial scale. So Larry Union is one of four stations under the Agricultural Services Division. Um, we have us, we have the St. Augustine Nurseries, Marpa Farm and the National Seed Bank. You can get more information on, on all these stations by visiting the website there in blue, agriculture.gov.tt, if you would like further information on services and products that we offer. Right, so this is who we are. This is where we are. We are actually located on the Karani North Bank Road. Um, like if you head into Arima, actually we're closer to the um, Arima racetrack. I'm sure most of you have come through La Reunion and visited, especially around the Corpus Christi time um, for plants, because we don't only do breadfruit plants, we do a number of different commodities. So we've been in existence for about 70 years, right? We occupy about 92 acres of land. In fact, and all 92 acres are under production, um, both with our germplasm fields as well as our um, screen house, not screen houses, um, glass houses and propagation sheds. Right, so like I said, we don't only produce breadfruit trees, we produce cocoa, coffee, avocado, mango, and a number of fruit plants. In fact, we, they call us the cocoa station, right? And one of the key activities that we're involved in is the preservation and conservation of our genetic germplasm. And what is, what is germplasm? Germplasm is simply um, any plant or animal material that is collected and stored for future use. And why is that important? Well, uh, should something happen, um, a natural disaster and our agriculture sector is compromised or damaged, we would be able to provide material in terms of plants and seeds back to farmers to restart um, the industry. So we're going to talk breadfruit. Atocarpus altilis. Um, breadfruit is known in many regions, not only in the, the Caribbean, and it's it's known by different names. When we were preparing this presentation, I was told that um, many of the older folks would refer to breadfruit as pimwa. You know, I've heard farmers uh, refer to it as bullhead. In Hawaii, it's known as ulu. So our Spanish neighbors, they call it fruta de pan. And recently we've been seeing it referred to as Caribbean potato, Caribbean tree potato. And um, I guess that has to do a lot with its texture and similarity to our, our local sweet potato. So how did breadfruit reach to Trinidad and the, Car the Caribbean? It arrived here a couple hundred years ago, 1793 to be exact, by the Royal Navy, and it was brought to provide food, cheap but nutritious food for labor on plantations and British colonies. So, the varieties of breadfruit propagated by the La Reunion Plant Propagation Station. We primarily do the local yellow types, as well as two Hawaiian varieties, Mafala and Masunwa. Now, the local yellow types um, have been selected over many years to be based on their eating quality, based on their palatability, based on their size. So the local yellow tends to be seedless. Of course, the flesh is a nice pale yellow when it's cut and when it's mature. It can weigh anywhere from three and a half pounds all the way up to eight, nine, ten pounds. It's green when immature and yellowish to green to almost brownish at maturity. And it can yield quite a lot. 
uh, sometimes between 400 to 600 pounds per tree, right? It's time to bearing is between two to three years, and these trees tend to get pretty big, sometimes well over 40, 50 feet, with a tree canopy between 20 to 30 feet. Um, the Hawaiian types, the Mafala and the Masunua, tend to be a little, a little smaller, and sometimes you may actually find seeds in these types. And um, it's because they're all related to the breadnut family, like chatine and jackfruit. But the eating quality is still fine. If you do get seeds in them, you just take it out and prepare to cook as normal. Their flesh, uh, their flesh is a little more on the creamy to whitish side. Um, they're a little smaller. These fruits are a little smaller because the trees are also a little smaller and more compact. Uh, maybe sometimes that's why people do the, the option to buy it is, is not there. They prefer to go for the local yellow. But I mean, it is a good bearer. The fruits are small, but it's ideal if you have a smaller backyard space. You know, you're limited on where to put this huge breadfruit tree. Sometimes people prefer to go with the Hawaiian types like the Mafala to put in their little small backyard because a small breadfruit is better than no breadfruit, right? So here we just have us um, some data illustrating how sales of breadfruit plants have been over the past 15 years. We've actually sold about 60,000 plants over the last 15 years across Trinidad and Tobago. And um, most of these plants you will find scattered throughout Trinidad and Tobago in estates. Um, there's very little pure stand because farmers mostly use breadfruit for intercropping. So, for example, on cocoa and coffee estates, you will find breadfruit because they provide shade for when the cocoa and coffee plants are young. And it's also good for the farmer because he will have um, the benefit of fruits and, and able to get a second income, right, while he's waiting on the primary tree crop to come into fruition. So um, I will now hand over to Mr. Ravi Narayan, who will walk us through the different methods of propagation and the method that we use at Larry Union for commercial production. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, good afternoon. Pro propagation of breadfruit. Some of the more common methods of propagation, as you would follow from the slide, are root cuttings, root suckers, stem cuttings, and air layering. For commercial production of breadfruit plants, however, we have found that stem cuttings and air layering are the most suitable to ensure that we could produce commercial quantities of breadfruit plants. They are very different from the traditional method of root cuttings or root suckers, which not, most of you will know produce one or two plants per tree. But when you require plants in volume, as the Ministry of Agriculture does, the stem cuttings and air layering provide more plants in a quicker or shorter time span. All right? We will go through the slides. You will see the ministries process of propagation of bread food through air layering. Here we have selection and preparation of the breadfruit stem. First, we prepare the stem area by removing the lower leaves and allow three to four leaves to remain at the top. These leaves are then trimmed in half. We identify the node where the color changes from brown to green. Using the button knife, we mark one half inch below this node and one half inch above the node below this. At each of these marks, the bark of the stem is cut in a circular manner completely around the stem. And this piece of outer bark is peeled off so that the inside woody tissue is exposed. The small ring of the stem bark was stripped away without damage to the xylem vessels using a sterilized body knife.
selection and preparation continued. Here, you see the exposed stem. We, we apply rooting hormone using a small paintbrush. The rooting hormone used is a mixture of indole butyric acid and naphthalene acetic acid. The rooting hormone is applied, and after which we use cocoa moss. Cocoa moss is something that is found on growing on cocoa trees, especially in the rainy season. If you look at it here, you see it's just a, a nice handful of moss, and that is applied to the exposed surface of the stem. And we use, at the station, we use foil, which is the most convenient or easiest way to hold the moss into place, right? After the moss is applied, the entire stem is wrapped securely using the foil, ensuring that the moss is covered and the foil is secured both above and below the stem, as you will see here. Following this, we use plastic tape, it's just a small strip of plastic that we would wrap around the foil and onto the stem in this area. That is to prevent water from entering by running down the stem. Once we do that, we would put a label, the date that the plant was air layered. Right? This will help for monitoring because normally tree to four weeks after we do this air layering, we would peel the foil back and look for roots. Right? This is where once the, the roots have formed, as you will see in this picture, you see a mass of roots covering the moss. We would now proceed to putting of the rooted stem. I see in my face. and full soil as you would see here right the soil and the cutting in the bag is secured right so that the plant is kept upright the bags are watered properly and then these are placed into the glass shed placement in the glass shed. So these are the potted plants you see here on our trolley and we move it into the glass shed which is a shed that has 50% light and 50% shade. The plants remain here for a period of three to four weeks until they are hardened. Then we transfer them to the saran shed. The saran shed now gives 25% light. Plants are removed from the glass shed and placed into the sarin netting shed. They stay here for a period of three to four weeks and are allowed to harden in preparation for the field. In the sarin shed, this is where a lot of the maintenance of the rooted breadfruit plant takes place, where plants are sprayed preventatively with insecticides and fungicides. Granular fertilizer is used as necessary to develop the leaves and to develop the stems. Also a water-soluble fertilizer is used once per month 
and the plants must be watered daily to maintain proper growth. All weeds are removed from the bags as necessary. And after three to four weeks in this saran shed, the plants are normally ready for sale, as you would see here. This is about the height you would get. Some might be taller, but this is the average of a saleable plant in the sense that when you come to purchase, you can get a plant about this size to purchase. It is be close to two to three feet tall. Right? For the entire propagation process, you can visit this link and you would see on YouTube the end. We did a video with the entire breadfruit alien process. Right? So you can try it at your home too. And if not, you can purchase plants from us at La Reunion. The hormone that you can use if you're doing it on your own, any liquid rooting hormone, right? Not the powdered ones, just the liquid ones. Thank you. I now hand back to Ms. Rambrook. Pest and disease management in industry. Sorry about that. The most common pests are mealybug and scale insects. And for that, or for control of those pests, at La Reunion, we use systemic insecticides. And the example here is azadiractin, which is a neem-based insecticide. So it's botanical and sometimes organic. So it's safe for the workers and also anybody working um, or coming into the station. The fungal or, yeah, we get mostly fungal diseases. And here you see sclerotium and phytophthora. Uh, these cause like soft rot and sometimes black rot on the stems. And in the, after we put the breadfruit, that is when you find that most of these diseases come in because you would have heard me say that you need to water regularly. And with this presence of moisture, you find that fungal diseases, especially in the rainy season, tend to be more prevalent. For the sclerotium and the phytophthora, we both use systemic fungicides. Um, I would encourage if you have any problems to visit the agro shops and read the labels carefully because once the fungicide recommends um, or is, is recommended for that disease, then it will work, right? For sclerotium, we use tebiconazole, and for phytophthora, we use dimetamorph. Right? Okay, I now hand you back to Ms. Rambo. All right, thanks, Ravi. That lovely presentation. Um, Ravi is actually the officer in charge of production of the breadfruit plants. So. All right, so just we're on to this slide now. We often ask, um, how do we know when, how do we know when breadfruit is ready to be harvested? Right, so we've put up some pictures of some immature fruits. As you can see, the immature fruits are bright green in color. If you look at the texture, the texture tends to be very bumpy. It's not, it does not have a smooth surface. The lines in between the segments are solid green. They haven't changed colors yet, right? And if you try to cook this immature breadfruit, it's, it's not going to have that nice, rich breadfruit flavor. It's going to just be rubbery and watery. And when, when breadfruit is harvested immaturely, it does not ripen. And if you look at the pictures on the right here now, these are what we call mature, half ripe breadfruit. This is the kind of breadfruit you want for the oil dog. As you can see, the color has changed. It has now gone to uh, a more yellow color to brownish. And if you look in between the segments, you're going to see the color changes from solid green to brown. And in some some fruits, they actually crack and exude um, a sticky sap so that you know these fruits are good. The fruits that are mature, they've begun to convert their starches into sugars. And so once cooked, you're going to get a nice, smooth, creamy texture with a rich breadfruit flavor. Right, so. All right, so. 
we have a couple of breadfruit hacks for you. You know, nowadays everything is about hacks. I have two teenagers at home and everything is, they always telling me about these life hacks they're seeing. So today we're going to share some breadfruit hacks with you guys to increase shelf life. A mature, a mature breadfruit will continue to ripen after it's harvested, right? To delay the ripening process, you can either place it in the refrigerator, um, and don't get worried because yes, the skin will turn brown, but the edible flesh will still be very, very, it will still be fine. And I've tried it before. I've left um, breadfruit in the refrigerator for about maybe a week and it was still fine. It was good. It boiled good. It cooked well. So you don't have to worry. Or you can, after harvesting, you can immediately place the breadfruits in water to make sure, um, sorry. After harvesting, immediately place the breadfruits in water. What this does is that it brings down the internal temperature of the fruit caused by um, respiration and, and the sun, right? And it delays ripening. But what you want to do is make sure it's completely submerged, not like how we have it here with half of the breadfruit still exposed. It has to go completely under the water. So if you want, you could place something on the tub to make sure that the breadfruits go right down into the water. And we all know when we peel in these breadfruits, they're sticky. I mean, I don't peel breadfruit. My husband will tell you that's his job. So one of the ways that we could kind of help the situation is by cutting off the stem. And it, but as, that has to happen immediately after harvest, right? And place it on a cut end for about 10 to 15 minutes. This actually drains out most of the sap. So by the time you slice it up and ready to cut, you don't need to put oil on your fingers and your hands and your knife and that sort of thing. So try it and let me know how it works. So we talk all kind of thing about breadfruit, except the nutritional aspect of breadfruit. And it's no wonder it's called a superfood or superfruit because, I mean, it contains antioxidants, carotenoids, fiber, omega-3 and 6 fatty acids, iron, protein. Breadfruit is high in complex carbohydrates, low in fat and cholesterol. It is gluten-free. And a point to note is this. It has a moderate glycemic index. And what this means, especially for the people who are diabetic and have diabetic conditions, is that when it's eaten, it releases sugars into the bloodstream slowly. It doesn't release it all at once to give you a big spike in your blood sugar, right? As, as when you, especially when you compare it to things like white potato, white rice, or white bread. So, you know, and breadfruit is so versatile. You can make from breadfruit flour to fries, oil dung. You can roast it, make breadfruit salad, breadfruit pie. I mean, and it has been used hundreds of, from hundreds of years ago to now. So just a couple of quick points uh, before we wrap up this presentation. Plants cost $25. Um, if you are a registered farmer and have a farmer's ID, you will be able to get a price break on 50 plants and over and you'll pay $15 a plant. Um, plants are available all year round in the station. Now I know some of you may say when you come to purchase plants, you're only allowed one or two. But if you have a project and um, you want to set up a large acreage of breadfruit, come and chat with us, come and let us know. And um, we can, you know, at least prepare to maybe do those plants for you in a timely manner, of course. And like I said before, breadfruit is usually intercropped on most farms and estates across TNT. And peak availability of fruits is between February to September. And that brings us to the end of our presentation today. Um, I just want to say thank you for joining us and um, sharing your time with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the Larry Union Plant Prop Station. Don't be a stranger. Come on and say hi. Right. Um, we have a more than capable and competent technical staff, as you can see from the photo there, ready to assist and serve and give advice if necessary. Right. So. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I think we have a couple of questions that have been posted that we're going to try to answer if we can now. Okay, so I'm seeing a question from Mr. Raul Bermudez. 
why are we not allowed to plant in public spaces? Why are we not allowed to plant bread fruit in public spaces? Um, well, Mr. Bermudez, I think we first have to find out if the public space is private or um, or government, you know, and um, we have to try and find out who the owner is. I'm not aware that we aren't supposed to plant breadfruit trees in any particular area. But I think the question is going to be is who owns the parcel of land? And I guess once you find that out and you make the necessary um connections or requests through the proper channels, I don't see it being a problem. So I hope that answers your question, Mr. Bermudez. And Mr. Bermudez is no stranger to Larry Union, by the way. Okay. Okay. All right, um, Ali, uh, Ali Etrini asked, can the same propagation method be applied to shatine, which is a similar type of plant? Yes, it can, um, but shatine can also grow from seeds, so it's 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 up to you. Is that that's true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, Uh, in response to Ali at Etrini, I see Melvin Mello Lindsay say, yes, but the structure may not be as strong. That is, that is very true and correct. With the cuttings, you find the root system is more fibrous or surface. And with the seedling, for the shatine, right? Um, because it grows from seed, you have a tap root system. So that is why the shatine is more suited for growing from seed. Because of the tap root, it could grow almost anywhere. But with the fibrous root system, you find that it's more susceptible to um, not or, or more susceptible that when you have waterlogged conditions, you could have some of the breadfruit trees or the shatine. If you do earlier, the trees will actually dry because the, the roots are more at the surface. But with the tap root, uh, they tend to survive better in, in water. Right, so that is why the shatine is more done because it could be grown from seed. You get a tap root system. All right, you're welcome, Ali. Hi, Montserrat. Thanks for joining and viewing. Oh. 
All right. Well, um, if there's no further questions, we will just say thanks once again for joining and viewing. And you can always post questions later. And um, once we see it, we'll try to answer. Or you can contact us directly via phone, via uh, email, whatever. We'll try to assist. Or feel free to visit the station whenever you are, have the time. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. So thank you and have a pleasant day, everybody. Stay safe. Take care. Bye.